The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. If you would join me in a word of prayer. God, you indeed are so good. Just as we just sang, Father, we are so unworthy of all that you have done for us in Christ. We're unworthy of Christ going to a cross and hanging in our place, bearing all the punishment that we deserve for our sin upon himself. But God, we thank you. We thank you that we are benefactors of this amazing grace. That God, you took our place that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Thank you, God, for that sacrifice. Thank you, God, for this time of worship. And now as we open your word, Father, I pray as, as you say in your word, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire. God, thank you for that promise. Now would your word go forth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you would turn with me in your Bibles to the book of John, we'll be in John chapter 6 this morning, and as already has been mentioned, uh, the elders and some of the other men like myself at the church are going to be leading a series through the I Am statements of the book of John. And the first I Am statement we'll be looking at this morning is, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. So as you're turning in your Bibles to John 6, what I'd like to do, three things. First, I'd like to introduce the book of John. Um, Secondly, discuss the significance of these I am statements. And then thirdly, unpack our text then here in, in John 6, this I am the bread of life. So John, the, the book of John, is, it's often considered the spiritual gospel. It's written primarily to highlight the deity of Christ through his earthly ministry. And while the synoptic gospels sort of follow their own flow or outline, the gospel of John is sort of a standalone gospel. And the fact that it, it highlights unique aspects about Christ's life that the other gospel accounts don't. Hence, we get these I am statements. If you like a really succinct thesis statement or purpose statement for a book, John provides us with one of those. In John chapter 21, verse 31, he says this. He says, Many other signs Jesus performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, you may have life in his name. Some have referred to the book of John as the unveiling of Christ's glory. That as we open up this book, we're just sort of progressively seeing more and more of the glory of Christ and his deity. I think more than any other book in the Bible, the the gospel of John is, we get explicit description from Christ as to who he is. And so that's the question I think we seek to answer in this text and in these I am statements to come. Who does Jesus say he is? And we'll get plenty of opinions from man. It's tempting even for us to import our own opinions about who Christ is. But the point of this is to humble ourselves and say, you are the surgeon and we are the patients. Christ, who do you say you are? And that's what I think we'll get from this book. And to do that, Jesus is going to use a very unusual, yet profoundly meaningful sentence structure, which is what we call the I am statements, to characterize who he is. In the Greek, I am is ego eimi. Ego, I am. It's another form of the verb to be. And eimi is also I am. Now, what's strange about this statement is that Jesus doesn't select one of these verbs. He actually puts them both together, ego, a, me. It almost sounds like redundancy. I am, I am, he's saying. 
And yet this, while this structure is, is rare, we can trace it back to the Old Testament. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. This is the clearest connection I think we can make to the, the, these I am statements. It's found in the Septuagint, which is just the, the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. In Exodus 3.14, God reveals himself to Moses in a burning bush. And here's how he refers to himself. He refers to himself as, I am who I am. It's the same structure and the same verbs in the Greek. Now, this is the name that God has given himself. And it points to his self-existence, his eternality, or as theologians refer to, his aseity, which, which refers to the fact that God is self-sufficient in himself. He's, he's perfectly perfect in himself, an attribute that only God can claim. And it's also considered God's memorial name to all generations, as Exodus 3 also tells us. And it refers to his covenant-keeping nature. And here's the key. It's that name that Jesus uses, which clearly, without a shadow of a doubt, is calling to attention his deity. So if anyone ever says to you, well, Christ never associated himself or referred to himself as God, you can point them right to these I am statements and say it's right there. This is language associated with divine pronouncements. And in using this, Christ is no doubt drawing attention not only to his deity, but also to the fulfillment of covenant. That God is faithful to fulfill his promises from Exodus 3 in Christ. And the Jewish authorities, they're, they're fully aware of this statement and its significance. And that's why they get so fired up, right? They know what Christ is claiming when he says, I am. Now, I am actually appears 23 times in the Greek text of this gospel. However, in, in several of these, in fact, the seven we'll be looking at, he connects the I am statement with a metaphor. And he does this to express his saving relationship toward the world, almost to say, I am the one sent from heaven for the purpose of of exalting the Father through my saving of man. And so as we look at these statements, Jesus is the focal point. In our text this morning, he's the focal point rather than the concept of, of bread. He's providing us with clear information as to his saving relationship with man. So that question, again, who does Jesus say he is? And that we are part of that is, is quite amazing. The seven I am statements, I just want to read all seven of them. I am the bread of life, which we'll look at today. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And I am the true vine. And so as we take up these statements, the goal is to deal with the content of these claims what do these statements, what do these claims reveal about Christ? So that's our focus as we go into this series. Um, and of course, our desire is that we would all be conformed to the image of Christ as we behold him and who he says he is, the true Christ of the Bible. So let me read our text, and then we'll, we'll pray together again. If you look with me at John chapter 6, we're only going to be looking at verses 25 through 35. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered them and he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him, the Father, God, has set his seal. Therefore they said to him, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered them and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What then do you do 
for a sign so that we may see and believe you. What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Father, thank you. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you, God, most of all for Jesus Christ. Thank you, God, for who he says he is. And Father, I just pray that every single one of us would submit to Christ. Submit to him and his words and his claims. God, that we wouldn't assume the position of lordship over him. For God, he is Lord. He is Lord over all. So God, please, would your spirit attend to our hearts. Keep us humble as we would allow your word to do its rightful work in our midst, God. Would it change and transform hearts and conform us to the image of Christ? We pray and beg you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, one of the things I have been pondering as I've been preparing for this sermon is the effect of consumerism on the church. When I say the church, I speak universally about the church, um, but probably narrow in a little bit on the church of America. And I confess that I think much of this is probably affected my generation more than other generations. But I got reading, and I sometimes like to peruse through Gospel Coalition's articles, and I came across an article entitled, Chipotle Church and the Problem of Choice. I want to just read an excerpt from that, because I think it helps us understand a little bit of our context here. Just as we pick and choose from our preferred proteins beans and vegetables in the Chipotle line, we think about church as a thing we can design according to our various tastes and hankerings. If a church stops catering to our particular appetites or begins causing us stomach aches, the pastor says something disagreeable, worship music becomes nauseatingly emotionalist, someone speaks in tongues, we simply move on. There are dozens of other places to get a burrito in town. Surely one of them will meet all or most of our checkboxes of likes, dislikes, and allergies. I think the point of that article is to show us, man, we've lost our commitment to the local body. And I think it's a reflection of our our hearts because part of this consumeristic mentality, it may be a, a product of the culture and society we live in, sure. But really at the heart of consumerism is the God of self, where we aim to feed and satisfy the demands of self. But of course, at the heart of the gospel is a call away from self, which is the problem, toward God, who is the solution. And I think as we speak about consumerism, it has affected believers and unbelievers alike. While the world may worship self through their consumeristic pursuits, it's easy for Christians to allow even this mentality to invade our personal walks with Jesus. We begin to ask this question. Just ponder this with me because I had to ask myself this question. Do I see Jesus for what he can give to me or what he can do for me? Do I come to Jesus and I say, what can Jesus, what can you do for me, Jesus? where we assume the gospel is about me. And it's this kind of mindset that was pervasive even in Jesus' time, as we'll see in our text. What can I get from Jesus? What do you have to offer me? And then maybe I'll follow you. And this I am statement here in John 6, I think, stands in the face of that kind of mentality. I'm going to do this. I'm going to take this thing off and I'm going to go to the mic. The product of small ears. So I do apologize. All right. 
All right, thanks, brother. I hope you all can hear me. Do we need to bring it up a little bit? Testing, testing. All right, we'll go with that. Sorry about that. So here's the deal. I think as we deal specifically with this claim, it's, it's important that we understand the context of what's going on here, all right? And understanding Jesus' claim as the bread of life. And I think we must first acknowledge that our understanding of bread is probably very different than the understanding of bread in Jesus' time. Okay, as he makes this statement, we live in an, in an industrialized society. So this is going to affect our understanding. Just like our Chipotle analogy, more than likely you opened up your refrigerator this morning and you were posed with a question. What am I going to eat this morning? And what am I going to drink with what I, I eat and you likely had a number of decisions to make. D.A. Carson makes the point. He says, our view is so skewed. He said, you ask any young child where food comes from, from, and they will likely respond with your local grocery store, right? King Supers or Costco. In our day, we aren't really affected by food shortages or natural disasters. If, if there's some sort of catastrophe, well, what happens? Food prices go up just a little bit. And as it pertains to bread, there are entire aisles just devoted to bread. Sometimes if you're like me, I get a little stressed out going down the bread aisle. Is it 100% whole wheat over here? Is it, is it made with real flour versus non-real flour? Is it multi-grain, half-grain, quarter-grain? You know, you go down the line, and then you get the gluten-free options in, and then you're really in a mess. Now, you compare this, though, of course, to a non-industrialized society... And they had a vastly different association with bread. In first century Palestine, 85% of someone's income went to buying bread. Buying food, I should say. And bread was the primary source of sustenance. So bread shortages were debilitating to a society. So this claim of Christ could have enormous implications to a society that is so dependent on bread. And context, as we've already said, is so important, so we have to understand this context. Two other important presuppositions we have to take into consideration pertaining to bread, particularly in our text here in John 6, this is probably what came to mind for the Jews. Number one, Jesus had just fed the 5,000. This had already occurred. Jesus miraculously took two fish, five barley loaves, and he multiplied them to feed the thousands. Okay, there was an abundance, even leftovers. The crowds probably think, this is great. We didn't have to buy food last night. And here they are the day after. Their stomachs are probably just starting to growl. They're saying, we're ready to be fed again, Jesus. Second presupposition that we have to make. The Jews understood their history and they knew the Old Testament account when for 40 years God caused manna to come down from heaven to feed the people daily. You can read about that in Exodus 16. So they're coming to Jesus and they're saying, Moses is going to feed our bellies again. This is a good deal. And all of that presupposed our section here then in verses 26 through 35. Three implications of Christ as the bread of life. And if I were to entitle this sermon something, I would title it something, I'd title it Jesus, God's manna. Three implications then of Christ as our bread. Number one, he is eternal life. Number two, he is God. And number three, he is the all satisfying one. And this discourse found here in verses 26 through 35 are, is really going to highlight these implications. And what it's going to do is it puts Christ on the scale and man on the scale. And we're going to see the motives of each played out in this discourse. Man's motives, what can you give to me, Jesus? Prove yourself, Jesus. And Jesus' response, I am the all-sufficient one the all-satisfying one whom the Father has sent to you that you may have eternal life for I am the bread of, bread of life. And there, there are comparisons throughout Scripture, but I think this is one that really highlights the sinfulness of man 
against the glory of Christ. I especially like this I am statement, I think, because it really exposes the heart of man. Where are we drawing our satisfaction from? Something I think we need to ask ourselves regularly in this Christian walk. Of course, we know this text falls on the heels of Jesus walking on water to meet his disciples on their way back across the sea to Capernaum. So many who were following Jesus were confused. How did he manage to get across the sea? And so that's why they ask in verse 25, Rabbi, when did you get here? Verse 26, Jesus did not respond to their question, did he? But rather he questions their motives, which he often does, right? He kind of reverses position. You may have that question while I'm turning this back on you. And so Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. You see, by providing them with food, Jesus was meeting a physical need. He was filling their bellies. He was also taking care of a massive financial need, right? Their their pocketbooks were still full. So Jesus questions their motives. They saw the signs, but they did not see their significance. Piper says they were excited about bread as their pleasure, not Christ as their treasure. So this was not full hearts with enlightened minds beholding an awesome God. This was full bellies. And so right from the beginning of this discourse, we need to ask ourselves the question, what brings me to Jesus? Maybe coming to Jesus will help me gain some sort of social status. Or maybe it's my my family. This will bring order to my kids to have good people in their lives. It's my living condition. And these are not illegitimate things, but that is not what Jesus is here for. So Jesus, seeing right past the false motives of the crowd, he gets to the point, right? He says, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him the Father God has set his seal. Again, a comparison is being made here. The food which perishes versus the food which endures to eternal life. And so what is Jesus saying here? He begins the statement by saying, do not work. Do not work. And there's a link here then between the striving of these men and their wrong motives. Right? Our works are always selfish. They're intended for our benefit. We work so that we can have something to boast about. And you see, Jesus is exposing their hearts. He says, you're looking at the messianic kingdom only in the physical way, but not with the spiritual eyes, seeing your need for eternal life. And so Jesus is saying, your work, your work is futile because you are working for the food which perishes. Your ambitions are so low Why are you settling for so little? You are after food which will provide temporally. It will fill your belly for a little while, and then guess what? You will get hungry again. It always falls short. You're striving for something that may meet a physical need, but has no bearing on your spiritual need, your need to be reconciled to God. And think of all the things then that man esteems higher than eternal life. A few texts that come to mind. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 12. This is Jesus' encounter with the rich fool. Luke chapter 12, verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, Tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to a man, who appointed me a judge or arbitrator arbitrator over you? Then he said to them, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has abundance does his life consist of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, 
The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, That is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many good goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. How true this is of the world we live in. We, we love our comfort. We love our security. And we will deal with those things, won't we? But then why don't we deal with our eternal security? That's the question we have to ask. That's the most important question we will ever ask. Look with me at Isaiah 55, picking up in verse 1. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for, for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and last text, you don't have to turn there, I'll read it for you, Jeremiah 2, verse 13. And this just, again, further substantiates the sad condition of man to place our ambitions on that which is temporal rather than that which is eternal. Listen to God's rebuke through Jeremiah. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water to hew for themselves broken cisterns which hold no water. Just picture that with me for a moment. Right before us is a fountain flowing with living waters. Here we are in a desert. And we forsake that fountain flowing forth with water and we run to the jars that are scattered about along our path and the thing about these jars is that they have no bottom to them. They hold no water. And we race through this life going from jar to jar to satisfy what only Christ can satisfy. Where we're, we're eating from the dumpster when we have a feast prepared right before us in Christ. You are forsaking the interest of your eternal soul when you feast on the perishing food of this world. And Jesus offers us food which endures to eternal life. He is the mediator. He is the one, as our text says, whom the Father has set his seal. So he has the credentials to then offer eternal life. This is the one whom God has sent his very son. So what is this temporal bread then that we eat that Jesus is referring to. It may be the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. It may be materialism. It may be social status. It may be man-made religion. I'd say it's anything that we hold in higher esteem than Jesus. Or better yet, anything that we are looking to satisfy us outside of Christ. And this can be so subtle even in the church where we can so easily start worshiping the gifts rather than the giver. The peripherals rather than the source. And oftentimes it is, it's the good things that creep in. But when they take the place of Christ, that's when we have problems. And I think that's what Jesus is addressing here. He says there is something more substantial to go after. Something that satisfies and something that provides sustenance. It endures to eternal life. I love 
Chick-fil-A. And I really love Chick-fil-A strawberry milkshakes, light on the whipped cream. And I love them. But if all I eat or drink are Chick-fil-A milkshakes, I will get very sick. And every child in here should be nodding their heads. Right, Kayla? Nodding your head, no. We would get sick if that's all we ate because we need substance. And the same is true spiritually. It just is. It's true spiritually. We need to check our hearts and ask the question, am I filling up on the desserts of Christianity, the benefits, the gifts, the blessings, or am I filling up on the substance, namely Christ? Now back to our text. Instead of tell us more about this bread as we would hope the the multitudes would respond, instead they respond with this. What do we do that we may work the works of God? They clearly misunderstood. Give us the formula. What must we do to get more of this bread? I think this this reveals the innate confidence that we can have in ourselves, our self-sufficiency and ability. I have it in and of myself, and that's man's religion. I can achieve eternal life. And oh, how we want to be at the helm, right? We want to be at the helm, calling out the shots to our God as he sits quietly and obeys our demands. That's what my works achieve. They keep God at a distance. And and somehow along the way, we we act like God is in debt to us. You owe me this, God. It's the idea that if I turn to God, he will receive a considerable benefit. And you know the fruit of that. As soon as trial hits or something comes about that shakes us, we say, God, how could you let this happen? Instead of recognizing that I have nothing in myself apart from Jesus, I don't control this, that this is God's work, He is Lord and I submit to Him. Oh, how we make God up in our minds and we try to make Him fit our agenda. John MacArthur was asked, why is there so much religion in the world? And his response, I think, is fitting. Men are so self-righteous. We are so self-righteous. And isn't that true? And I think that's really the hinge point of Christianity compared to all other religions. Other religions tell us, what can you do? What can I do to achieve eternal life? And we know Christ to say, it is finished. It is finished. And that's... Such a glorious truth of this gospel. Now I can stand up here and I can tell you that Jesus is a million times more precious than any amount of money. That He's infinitely valuable and beautiful like nothing else in the world. I can tell you that a hundred times over. But until the Spirit of God attends to our hearts and open up the, opens up the eyes of our hearts, those will just be words. See, it is. It's a tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. Like the song goes, There my heart has found its treasure. Christ is mine forevermore. And what we see in our text is that Christ is so patient with us. Praise God for his patience. He is so patient with us. And Jesus responds, he says, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Look at Jesus, he's saying. This is a personal trust. Believe on Jesus. That's all God requires. That's what faith is. And so so here we see Jesus revealing himself to man, serving the needs of the people, loving them all while proclaiming the kingdom of God which has been opened up for us to enter. And then look at the response. What do you do for us? Prove yourself. Talk about the the condemnation of man's heart. The clear irony of this statement is that what has Jesus' ministry done? 
This is the same man who turned water into wine and healed the nobleman's son and the paralytic man who had been ill for 38 years and just the day prior had fed 5,000. And and, and even think about our position. Here we are on the other side of the cross. Jesus who rose from the dead proclaiming victory over sin and death And we say, Jesus, prove yourself. The irony right before us. John Calvin observed, he said this. He said, this wicked question, prove yourself, clearly shows the truth of what is said elsewhere. A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a miraculous sign. So here's the the contrast that we've spoken about. See Christ's open invitation and see the hardness of man's heart. And it should come as no surprise, right? Paul reminded the Corinthian church, listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, has not God made the foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Later he says, these things are spiritually discerned. Oh, that the Spirit of God would attend to every single heart, even here this morning, and cause cause us to see, maybe for the first time, who Jesus says he is. The Spirit come upon all of us. Look at verse 30. What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread out of heaven. Of course, they misunderstood, right? That it was not Moses who gave them the bread, but rather God. Moses was just the instrument. Again, we read about this in Exodus 16. God was faithful to feed his people in the wilderness. He satisfies them with bread from heaven. And each day, they would go out and they would gather the bread that had come down from heaven. And it was just enough for them to eat until the sun came out, grew hot, and would melt the remains away. And I'd say notice something important here. The people never denied the miracle. They never denied what Jesus did. They denied the claims of who he was. And you cannot disassociate the signs from the claims of Christ. True faith holds those together. It holds those together. Remember the whole purpose of this book. These signs have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. His signs always pointed back to himself. You can hear their hearts here, can't you? You may have fed 5,000, but there were millions in the wilderness and they were fed for 40 years, Jesus. J.C. Ryle says, pretending with this evidence, they might believe. Jesus, you just keep feeding us, then maybe we'll believe. The issue here is the lack of heart, not the lack of evidence that keeps man from Christ. And that's where we get this glorious response from Jesus in verses 32 through 33. Truly, truly, I say to you, It is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. So this manna that came down from heaven in in the wilderness was a type. Okay, it pointed to something greater. That's what types are. They, They point to a fulfillment. The manna was but a shadow of the things to come. And Jesus, he speaks of a better provision. He speaks of precious bread. And it has come in the form of a man, Christ, born in a small town called Bethlehem, which in the Hebrew means house of bread. And he says, my father who gives. Notice it's in the present tense. Because Jesus is before them. He's right before them. And he's saying, open up your eyes. 
Behold the true and genuine bread. This bread will feed any who will come. Manna was intended solely for the Jews in the wilderness. This bread is spiritual bread that has been shared with the whole world. Manna itself is dead, but Christ is the living bread. Manna would perish overnight, but Jesus is ever living. Manna can only reserve life, but Christ perpetuates life. Do you see how Christ, he's the fulfillment of all of these things. He is the fulfillment of this manna. He is indeed the bread of life. Why feast on anything less than the true bread then? Why would we go about our lives feasting on other things? And notice the response. We want that bread. Always give us that bread. Right? He, he will bless me with a car and a new house and abundance of wealth. Give me that, Jesus. Now that's the prosperity gospel. And I know we don't believe in that here. But how about this? He will restore my marriage. Give me that, Jesus. He will bring order to my household and clean up my kids' act. Give me that, Jesus. He will give me purpose and meaning to life. Give me that, Jesus. He will give me peace, joy, and happiness. Always give me that, Jesus. He will keep me out of hell. Bring me to heaven. Give me that, Jesus. And these things, while they are good and desirable, if we are worshiping these things, we will always come up empty. Christ calls us to come to him, not for these gifts, but again, for himself. Which is why he makes the profound statement in verse 35, I am, I am the bread of life. Ego eimi, the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Jesus is God's manna. That's the claim he's making here. This is a divine pronouncement of his deity and his union with God. He says, I am the one who the Father gives you. I am the true bread that comes from heaven and gives life to this world. Well, how could, how could Jesus make such a claim? How could he make such a claim? Well, well, all of the book of John points to this reality. That Christ was with the Father before the beginning of all time. You don't have to turn there. I'll just read John 1.1. 1, 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. John 1.18. No one else has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He, Jesus, has explained Him. John 3.13. Jesus to Nicodemus. No one has ascended into heaven but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. John 8, 54. If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me. And John 17, which is sort of the pinnacle of this union displayed. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. As we read those texts, this is why we can say God is the gospel. Just like Robert preached a couple of months ago. When we look at the gospel, we see amazing humility and, and compassion towards sinners. But we chiefly see the father delighting in his son as his son perfectly radiates the glory of God. We see a father exalted through the, the setting on display of his, son, of his son and the humble submitting of the son to his father, which is just highlighting this beautiful, eternal unity of the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the God that we must worship. That's the Christ who we are to admire. We're told he's the lion and the lamb. He's the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his nature. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, the one by whom, through whom, and for whom all things have been created. He is the one in whom the Father was pleased. 
for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him and to have all things reconciled to himself. Jesus is the true bread. He is the bread of life. And we have to settle that in our hearts. I want this bread. How do I get it then, Jesus? Well, you don't buy it. Jesus says, come to me and believe on me. Come to me and believe on me. And these are are parallel phrases. They're synonymous here. Coming and believing. The way we appropriate this is to come and believe on him by faith. This is not a physical coming. This is a decisive step of faith. Where I place my trust in Jesus and I say, Jesus, I know this to be true. I know you are who you say you are. And I submit to that. It's coming all the way to Christ. Not a step toward him. Not just a thinking about coming to Christ. Not not a stretching one foot forward as we keep one foot in the door of this world. How exhausting that is, right? I lived lived like that for so many years. Just trying to justify two lives This is a coming fully and decisively, and it's coming to Jesus, which implies what? It implies coming away from something, away from self and to Jesus. There's a spiritual thirst and a hunger. It's a realizing that this world just will not satisfy. It's empty. It's saying, I've been drinking from broken cisterns for too long. It's coming like Solomon in Ecclesiastes 2 to the point where we can say, for who can eat and who can have enjoyment without him? And as we realize the emptiness of these things, man, only then do we see our need for the all-satisfying one. And and then just think about the goodness of God as we just sang about. (coughs) He doesn't just offer us perishing bread every day. He offers us the eternal bread himself. So the call, the call has to be come to Jesus. Jesus loves that phrase, doesn't he? Come to me. He loves that phrase. Would you come to Jesus? Would you believe on him even this morning? This is far greater than just some sort of mental ascent greater knowledge. It's easy to live there. Like I said, I lived there for many years, but instead, this is a full appropriation. It's a transformation. I have tasted of something that nothing else in this world can come close to. Jesus himself says, he who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes on me will not thirst. He will satisfy us. He will satisfy our longing hearts, and that's what we have been created for. Look, look, Well, you don't have to look with me. You wouldn't have this in front of you. John MacArthur makes a few connections between our coming, our believing, and this bread as Jesus identifies himself. And I just want to highlight these. There's five of them. Number one, just as food is worthless unless it is eaten, so Christ is worthless unless he is internalized, actualized in our hearts. Number two, Eating is prompted by hunger. If you're full, you're not interested in him. Only God can awaken that desire in our hearts. Number three, the food people eat becomes part of them. Likewise, until we appropriate him by faith, we do not become one with him. Number four, eating involves trust. I had to trust that as I drank my smoothie this morning that Jackie didn't put kale in it again. (laughs) No one knowingly eats tainted food. So the very act of of eating implies faith. It implies faith. And fifthly, finally, eating is personal. Eating is personal. No one can eat a meal for another person. We will each individually stand before God. God. You're either for him or you're against him. So come and believe and you'll never be the same. And here's the paradox. After you taste of Jesus, you want nothing more but more of him, right? You just just want more. I just can't get enough of Jesus. 
And so this is, this is a call to, to look afresh at Jesus and to ask the question, is he enough? Because to say that Jesus is the bread of life is to say that he is the sufficient one and that nothing else in this world will satisfy except for him. And so ask that question and then ask this question, does my life reflect that? Am I feasting on him? Christ is an inexhaustible fountain of living water. He is the bread which endures to eternal life. For, for all eternity, the beauty of Christ will be put on display for us and we will behold him in his beauty. Can you say with the psalmist, one thing I have asked from the Lord that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. Can you say that? I mean, truly, with a, a judgment day sobriety in your heart, can you say that with the psalmist? And if this is true, then ask the question, how much time in the day do I give to my spiritual affairs? The biggest combat against consumerism and false motives in our pursuit of Christ is a heart that is secure in Christ, resting in him, having delved deep in communion with him. And just like the Israelites who daily sought after their food in the wilderness, that was their nourishment, we come to Christ and say, give me this day my daily bread. Does that reflect your life? To think, and just ponder this with me, I have an appointment with the King, with the Lord of Lords, with my Maker, and he waits eagerly for me every single morning. He waits eagerly for me. And I forsake him. Just ponder that for a moment. We are going after that which perishes so often. So often. There are so many distractions. It is hard to be a Christian in America today because there are so many distractions. So take seriously. Jesus is calling you to come and have this divine appointment with him every day. I think this is a call to reorient my life, our lives around the living bread. To feast on him in his word and in prayer in the secret place. And to say with our hearts, all I need is Christ. And when we can say that, then there is no circumstance, there is no trial that can break us. Because I have tasted and, tasted and seen that he is good. Only then I think we can say with Samuel Rutherford, if your Lord calls you to suffering, do not be dismayed, for he will provide a deeper portion of Christ in your suffering. So that all our lives, I just, I just want more of Christ. I just want more of Christ. Whatever comes my way, I just want more of Christ. And let me just say lastly as we close. As we read this discourse, I think we all hope that everyone in attendance, in attendance would bow down and worship Jesus, that there would be a massive revival right there. But that doesn't happen, does it? There is grumbling among the people, even anger and hostility. And ultimately, John 6, 66, many of his disciples withdrew and we're not walking with him anymore. Some may hear this message and suppress it. True hearts are exposed. I just wanted the blessings. And yet, yet like ones standing on sandcastles, we will face our God and we will face the question were we faithful to him to the end? And the Lord may look at us as we stand on our sand castles that we've created with our own hands. The most chilling words, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. Would that not be the response that any of us here, here this morning? May this be our response. Look at our text, verse 67. So Jesus said to the 12, 
you do not want to go away also, do you? And Simon Peter, the zealous one, answered him and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have words of eternal life. We have been given the opportunity for this kind of response. Because there's nothing, there's nothing better in this world that's offered to us in Christ. This is what we've been made for. The very longing in your heart is a longing to be made into the image of Christ. And so again, the call, would you come to Christ today? Christ says, come and live. Come to me, and he says, I will certainly not cast you out. So would we all come to to the King of Kings and submit our lives to him, even this morning? Let me pray. Oh, Father, thank you, God, for Jesus. Thank you, God, that he is indeed the bread of life. That, God, he is the one we've been seeking all our lives. And, And, God, for those who have tasted of him, Lord, thank you that we have tasted of something sweet. Thank you for your goodness, God, that you you satisfy our longing hearts. And, and, And you offer yourself to us as a daily portion, God. Thank you that your mercies are new every single morning and that we can seek you afresh. And may we do that even this morning. And God, for anyone that doesn't know you, Lord, I just pray for them, Lord. I pray that maybe for the first time they would see that this world just hasn't satisfied my longing heart. But that there is a better provision, the best provision. There is Jesus. And he has offered himself to me. And that they would eat and feast upon him by faith. God, would you do that work in our midst by the power of your spirit. We thank you, God, for who you are. And it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. And we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.